Looks like we're live. Guys, girls, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're here again. We're back. We're live. Today, <clears throat> excuse me, my guest is Kyle Porter, and the Quarantine All-Stars interview series rolls on. Um, let me just, just once again say, holy crud. Like I want, <laughs> I put one post up one time and wound up getting booked out like over two months. Boom! In 24 hours. Kyle, I don't even, I think you had to, uh, like you couldn't get on in, in the first time you wanted, right? You had yeah, to like. I had to, I had to move things around, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I I hope and, and I assume and I trust that this means that uh, that we're doing something here that it matters to people. That's guys out in the audience. I hope you appreciate what we're doing for you here. Uh, my my kind of thought process was and remains. I'm. A, it's weird, man. And maybe you can tell me how you feel about this before we get into the meat of it. What I'm finding is that when this thing first started unfolding, um, I was struggling a little bit to wrap my head around it. There, there was a tendency, almost like a, a muscular reflex, to kind of like uh, go into denial a little bit, to ignore it, to just try to be like downplaying it, and and uh. So I, I I caught that tendency this time. And if I'm being honest, it's because when 2008 ha happened, I can look back on that and go, dude, you put your head in the sand for too long. And it really like you, you took away your ability to make decisions for quite a while being in this just like massive level of denial. <laughs> you know what I think is, is really, you know, and we're going to kind of, I don't want to jump into things too fast because, you know, I, I totally agree with you, but yeah. From a storytelling standpoint, that's really the beginning of any any story structure. Is there is this this inciting event, right? There's something yeah. that there's something that calls the hero, and we all are obviously you know kind of living as the hero in our own lives. Yeah. And one of the critical steps in in the hero's journey is what's called the refusal of the call, or the there's mm -hmm. the call to adventure. There's the inciting event, and there's this hey, there's all this stuff that we're going to have to deal with right now. And yeah. in most stories, you know, you look at the hero and they refuse the call at first. They say, I yeah. don't want to deal with this. I don't mm -hmm. want to, you know, it's because the hero starts in their ordinary world. They start yeah. in a world that, you know, that isn't perfect, but they're at least comfortable and familiar with right. it. Whenever there's something like this, that kind of rocks our world. And that's why storytelling is so powerful because we can bring, we can bring ourselves back to it over and over again. And it kind of gives us a framework, not only for our messaging, but also for a lot of our decision making. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's, that's a student insightful. Hey, Amanda, thanks for jumping on here. Uh, we've got hey, some, Amanda. of course, good stuff for you. So this time around, I kind of caught the, the, the whole sort of the mental tripwire, you know, trying to act. And I said, no, I got it. I got to do something. But mm -hmm. that being what it is, I still feel like part of my bandwidth and energy each day is just taken by this situation, whether I like it or not. And so I asked myself, like, what can I do right now? It felt tone deaf to be making offers, especially because prior to this, I was really doubling down on my service that gets people booked to speak. Well, first it was tone deaf. Now I see, well, that was actually good instincts because it's it's irrelevant to get booked to speak right now. Right. You, you know, got everything's online for the time being. Um, and so what I came up with was I just want to serve. I just want to serve and through there, hopefully um, position myself. Like, let's let's play the long game a little bit, you know. And so that's how we got here. Kyle, you've been in my world a little bit for uh, a couple of years now, I think, right? We, right? We've been sort of knowing each other for a couple of yeah, years. A bit, this yeah. is the first time we've really got to connect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> other than a couple of, you know, just calls and stuff. So um, you're going to be talking to us about message clarity and storytelling. Sure. I find that interesting. I want to I want to um I want to see what you got <laughs> basically. Yeah. So, what do you what, the floor is yours. Who are you? What do you do? How do you do it? Okay. So, here's here's kind of where where I step in with most most companies is this. Um, most companies are really really good at what they do. They can mm -hmm. they can provide whatever service you need them to provide and being sure. good at what you do essentially in, in our marketplace is a commodity. You know, yeah. any, 
any plumber that I hire is going to be able to come in and fix your pipes. Anybody's going to be able to give me a good haircut. So being good at what, like that's, that is the minimum, you know, sort of acceptable entry. It's table stakes. It's table stakes. It's exactly yeah. right. So people need to understand that. Art by being good at what you do. Right. And most people are, are good at what they do. And then yeah. when you start talking about branding and you start talking about setting yourself apart in the marketplace, mm-hmm. most people go to the visual side of branding. They go to, oh, I need a logo, I need fonts, I need colors, I need, you know, I need this beautiful design that's going to captivate people's attention. Well, that's not really what captivates people's attention. Mm-hmm. What captivates their attention is clarity in how you help them overcome their problems and move towards a more successful version of themselves. Yeah. So yeah, I often I often tell people spending money on design before you've built up an emotional connection is it's just a waste of money. It's just, I mean, there's there's a lot of colorful analogies for what that is, but exactly. basically the reason that Pepsi spends God, their budget is huge for marketing or for branding every year. And the reason is because they're connecting emotion to that symbol, emotion to that symbol. Without that, the symbol mm-hmm. is nothing. And that's what stories do. So stories right. are stories are an, a way to capture emotion because they're they're the way we evolve to communicate and to share things with each other. Because of a million years ago, you and I have our individual experiences. We're going to come together around a fire at the end of the day. And I'm going to say, Manny, I ate these berries today and I have got, I've got, you know, situations happening that you would, sure. and we're going to go, but I'm not going to eat those berries. Yeah. Right? So the storytelling became this way that humans from an evolutionary standpoint, were able to set themselves apart because I can now put myself in your shoes and you can put yourself in my shoes without having to experience all of those things individually. We can share those and can sort of contribute to this collective sort of awareness. And that's what stories allow us to do. So stories are this really powerful way to capture people's attention because they do capture people's emotions. And so when you're speaking to people on this emotional level, you're able to be really clear about how you help them survive, how you help them thrive in particularly times like this when, you know, there's this sort of unknown and uncertain, you know, if you can say, I have the tools and I, I have the ability to guide you through sort of this uncertainty, then you're going to capture a lot of people's attention. So give me an example from your own work, from your own portfolio of a before and after. Somebody who was expository with whatever their position was in the market, right? They're just telling, telling, telling. Mm -hmm. And then how it switched over to being more effective because uh, you incorporated some elements of story into it. Well, I'll to do that, I'll sort of, I'll double dip. I'll tell you how I got here. Um, sure. Great story of what, what put me in this place. Um, I started uh, my entrepreneurial journey as the owner of a martial arts school. So I opened up a martial arts school in Atlanta. Um, and we have a lot of, we have a lot of really, really high quality world champion, you know, competitive circuit martial mm-hmm. artists. And uh, we are exceptionally good at what we do. Um, and what I realized is that I'm really good or I was really good at teaching classes, but I was not really good at figuring out how to get people into those classes. So I had to dive yeah. into the yeah. marketing world in order to, you know, to feed my family at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I did that, I had to, you know, I sort of had to build the plane and fly the plane at the same time. I had to learn how to operate this business and also how to, how to market this business. And so that's kind of how I came across sort of the story model of marketing. And so that sort of took off. And, you know, I realized that what I had been talking about was I had been talking all about myself. I had been talking all about our world champion instructors and, you know, we can do this, this and this. And we had been positioning ourselves as the school. We had been positioning ourselves as the hero of the story and inviting people to come along for our story. Well, people are interested in coming along for our story because they're living their own. So right. what we need to do in, in any sort of marketing is we need to position ourselves, and this is why I named my company what I named it, we need to position ourselves as the guide in the story. So if you look at most stories, you know, you look at Harry Potter has Dumbledore and Luke has Obi-Wan, and you know, there's this character that steps in who has a plan and who calls the, the character to action and and you know, sort of is this a few steps ahead of the character and can guide yeah. through. Yeah. You know, and you look starting at, starting back with uh, the Inferno, right? Okay. Yeah, and and uh, the Odyssey, and so mm-hmm. so. In case you guys don't know, this goes all the way back to classic classic Greek literature. 
the word in Italian literature. The word mentor is actually derived from the name of it. It is the name of a character in one of the, the ancient Greek tragedies. Right. right. So, you know, it's it's somebody who is who is able to step in and lead this person by demonstrating empathy. And, you know, I understand what it feels like yeah. and also authority. And, and that's kind of the two components of, of being able to step in as this guide is, you know, I, I tell people all the time, if I went to my personal trainer and I said, hey, man, I'm really interested in losing 20 pounds and I just can't stop eating sweets late at night, you know, and he looked at me and he goes, me too, man. This is tough. You know, it's tough out here. Yeah, and he's right. Yeah. Empathy, but that's not the personal trainer that I'm going to hire. Right. And if I go to that same personal trainer and he says, you know what, you need to tough it out. You need to eat kale and I'll get down and give me 20 pushups. He's demonstrated authority and he knows exactly what I need to be doing. But he hasn't demonstrated that he gives, you know, he cares about my solution. So it's that combination. It's a hybrid of I, I, I know how to take you from where you are to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. but I also understand what it feels like to be lost. And yeah. And to be able to, to position yourself in your marketing as that, you know, as the person who is able to guide your customer to the solution that they want and, you know, over through or around the problems that they're experiencing, mm -hmm. it's a really powerful thing to be able to do from a positioning standpoint. And it all is kind of derived from that storytelling model. Nice. So um, let's go into kind of a, a checklist or a framework or a, a blueprint or whatever you want to call it. Like, Let's pick my my friend Amanda Warfield here, and we'll be we'll be hypothetical with her. You're going to make up her bad expository positioning and branding, and then walk me through how you change it. You know what she does? We can go. I mean, we can. It doesn't have to be hypothetical. Uh, I do know what she does. She coaches. Uh, she coaches women through getting out of narcissistic relationships. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So they're in relationships with narcissists. Yeah. Okay, got it. So. We always start with the character and what the character, who the character in the story, the hero of the story is. If we are positioning ourselves as the guy, then the customer is the hero of the story. So we say, all right, so these women who are in these relationships, what they want is they either want to figure out a way to get out of those relationships or they want to find themselves in a relationship that's happier. So we have to articulate really, really clearly first, who is our ideal customer and what, what are they trying to achieve? What does a win look like for them? Right. So we have to be we have to be very clear about who our customer is. So let's say that this you know these women want to find a way out of this relationship. Let's say mm -hmm. they want to find their way to a better a better future. What one thing that we really have to understand about storytelling in general is that stories are not about people learning how to solve problems. There's always a problem in a story, but stories are not about people learning to solve problems. Stories are about people becoming the type of person who can solve that problem. And that's a really important distinction to make because it's an identity transformation, not a skill development. It's not, I'm gaining the ability to do this. It's I'm becoming the kind of person who can do this. Mm -hmm. So what she's offering to these people and what becomes a lot more compelling is not just a path out of the relationship, but the confidence and self-assuredness and belief in themselves that they deserve better than the relationship that they're in, right? So that's what she's really offering to those people. And that's something that they're gonna carry with them throughout the rest of their lives, even once this story has been told. This is something that sticks with them, you know? And as they go through the rest of their stories in the rest of their life, this is something that they're gonna carry with them. Mm -hmm. So there's an identity transformation that we have to clearly establish. The second thing is, that we we have to present a problem there's there's this obstacle in the way and the first level is the most obvious which is sort of the physical you know ground level problem which is you're in this narcissistic relationship you're in this relationship with you know that just isn't working um and and, and we have to clearly identify that because we have to capture mm -hmm. people's attention we have to say this is what's going on in your life because once okay. we're introducing the problem our job is to get people's heads nodding our job is to get people saying like yeah i am going through that and i want to be this but i can't right now because i have to deal with this problem so we have to we have to identify the problem first the second thing we have to do is we have to talk about how that problem makes them feel we have to talk about when we when we say look you're in this this narcissistic relationship now where does that leave you emotionally so you know you may be feeling trapped you may be feeling isolated you may be feeling hopeless you know, and so again, our job is to get these people going, hey, I'm in this narcissistic relationship. I am feeling trapped. I am feeling hopeless. You know, I feel stuck. I, I just don't feel like I have a way out. And then at, at a, a much higher sort of 30,000 foot level, that's when we can start saying things, 
you know, it's sort of on a more philosophical kind of level where it's you deserve and you should and you shouldn't have to. And it ought to be this way, but it isn't, you know, because, again, our job is to to accelerate the pace of their head nodding. So it's you're in this narcissistic relationship. You're feeling hopeless. You're feeling stuck. You're feeling trapped. And you deserve a relationship that makes you happy. You deserve to be with somebody who appreciates you and doesn't think only about themselves. You shouldn't have to deal with someone who doesn't value you as a person, you know? And then at that point, we're speaking in some really, really compelling language once we've established kind of the layer that we want to speak on. So there's this physical layer and then the feelings layer and then sort of the philosophical layer. So it's three different layers of the problem. And then once we have that, that's when we can step in as the guide and we can say, look, I know what this feels like. You know, we demonstrate that empathy. I know what this mm-hmm. feels like. And I have a plan. I've done this before. I've helped hundreds of women get out of situations exactly like this. Right. You know, if you just step in, you know, if she's if this woman, you know, her ideal customer, if this woman is just talking to a girlfriend and the girlfriend is saying, gosh, you know, I I know how you feel. That just that must be terrible. I went through the same thing, or I'm going through the same thing, then you can commiserate together, but you're not going to rely on that person to get you out of that situation because they don't have the authority to do it. They haven't, they haven't built that credibility. But if, if Amanda, is that her name? Amanda's her name? Yeah. Yeah. If Amanda has said, look, I know what this feels like. I survived a narcissistic relationship. I got out of it. I developed a framework that will allow you to do the same thing and come out stronger on the other side. And I've actually helped deliver it for, you know, dozens or hundreds or however many women then that person, once I've clearly identified what they want and what's stopping them from get it, from getting it, now that I can step in and I can say, all right, well, here's here's what I've done, then then all of a sudden I'm a very compelling option. I'm very, very interesting to those people. Right. And this could be for people getting out of relationships. This could be for trainers. This could be for, you know, you could apply this framework to any business, literally. What do they sure. want? What's stopping sure. them from getting it? And then how can I demonstrate empathy and authority? Now, so, now, go ahead. So we've got the conceptual framework now, mm-hmm. right? Um, first of all, let me take a, a brief moment and say, uh, Amanda, Preet, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Welcome aboard. Um, it looks like there are a few other people watching as well. If you guys could could give us some thumbs ups, some hearts, some smiley faces. Um, it's really important, you guys. I just want to. I, I want you to understand how little it takes for you to click the button. But what it does, if you're enjoying what Kyle is teaching you, and uh, and if you're enjoying the fact that I'm doing these interviews for you every single day, it takes so little to tell Facebook, hey, there's something going on here we like, kind of tickle the algorithm, kind of jog it a little bit, uh, and it helps us so much, right? So the first thing I would like to ask you is please go ahead and just, just tap the thumbs up a few times. And then if you're really appreciating it, if, if, you, if you're seeing the value in what Kyle and I are doing, share it. Share it to your friends. Um, it is, again, it's something that really helps and it takes zero effort almost. I mean, it's it's hard to imagine something that takes closer to zero effort than sharing or, or just, you know, giving some thumbs up to show your appreciation. It's very interesting to me how in the realm of social media, we have become, and I'm not saying you ladies are complacent, but we've become so complacent that even like thumbs ups and shares are things that we just don't bother doing when we actually like something. So <laughs> when Amanda was taking notes. Now she's clicking. Because of what? Because of the next stage. What's like, that? So the next stage in the storytelling process um, is, is giving people a plan, is giving okay. If I'm the guide, I have to now say, I have to not just say, I have, you know, I have the ability to take you out of your problem, but I have, I have a plan. I have a simple three-step process. And, you know, I always tell people, imagine you're standing right in front of a river and you've got to get to the other side for whatever reason, you've got to get to the other side and the river's rushing. So my job as the guide, my job is to put stepping stones in that river that are at a distance apart that you don't feel overwhelmed taking any of those steps. If I make yeah. any of those steps nerve wracking for you, if I make them scary for you, then you're way less likely to take those steps. If there's any doubt mm-hmm. that you are going to be swept away by that river or any fear that you're going to be swept away by that river, you're not going to move forward. You're not going to take action. Right. So as the guide, I've got mm-hmm. a really simple plan that involves really simple steps that never feel unmanageable. And then mm-hmm. I've got to invite you. I have to call you to action, which is what you did. Mm-hmm. right? There. And it's, it's so simple. But most people just don't do it. And you're right that most people 
don't know what you want them to do until yeah. you say, I need you to click this button and tell me that you like what we're doing here. I need you to click this button and book an appointment with me. I need you to, you know, whatever it is. I need it unless we give people a really direct, very clear call to action. And that's why, you know, most people are so vague and so sort of dancing around what you actually want people to do, you know, and it's like, if you'd like to get started, then please reach out and we'll set a time. And it's like, what? Like, what do you, what do you want? Yeah. From me? You know, like, I need you to click this button. There's going to be a form. Yeah. Pull it out. Mm -hmm. click the next button. I'll handle everything yeah. from there. You know, right. Exactly. That's something that, you know, that people, it's tangible. People can wrap their head around it. And I think that, you know, we're complacent on both sides from a social media standpoint. We're complacent from, a, from yeah. a giving, giving feedback, giving, you know, a, yeah. approval or, a, you know, affection in a social media context. But we're yeah. also, I, I feel like very complacent from a, from a call to action. Standpoint. You know, it, I think that, now we may be getting, we may be turning the tractor off into the field a little bit here compared to your, your topic. And, and it, you're right. It is okay. But I think that on, on, on our side, it's not complacency as much as it's not knowing how to make an offer. Sure. Uh, uh, not that that's really something we have to dissect uh, unless you feel like it's really relevant to the storytelling, but it's, it's, it's worth talking about for a moment though um and because i think that we're gonna have to cut through the the cut through the crap even more in these in these bizarre times we're in right if you need somebody to to take action so that you can help them more than ever probably you're just gonna have to be able to tell them point blank you know so um i think clarity clarity wins over cleverness every time and i think people yeah yeah well said stand out they want to you know they want to separate themselves and i really feel like because of sort of this gaping lack of clarity in the marketplace yeah. in most industries if you just say look here's what i do here's how it helps you here's what you need yeah. to do get it now take action you really are going to stand apart and and people are going to step and people don't walk into fog they walk into they walk into clarity they don't step toward yeah. conclusion. if they're not sure about something you mean think about all the times that or think about what's going on in the world right now. You know, there's so yeah. much confusion. There's so much, how do I handle this? What do I do? What comes next? Yeah. You know, where do I go? And people are people are taking way less action. You know, there's not a whole lot of like, all right, I've got this really clear path in front of me. People are hunkering yeah. down, not only from a physical standpoint, but also from a very like kind of emotional, logical standpoint. They're not doing it. Yeah. You know? Right. And I think that, you know, when you don't have a clear path in front of you, it becomes really, really difficult to take that decisive action. So you give people that clear yeah. path. Yeah, uh, well said. So um, we've got we've got the framework, and we're 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 sort of we're getting down to the the well the clarity. Okay. Um, what I'm what I'm wanting to ask you now is it, it sounds like is your process to write out your your uh, story. And then how do you apply it to your frequent ongoing communications? You can't tell the same story the same way over and over again, nope. right? So it sounds like what you're doing is you're creating uh, something that that maybe could be used as um, almost like a guide or even prompts for copywriting. Is that right? Exactly what it is. So Okay. Talk about that. If, if, a, if a company hires me to work with them, then I can... Yeah lay out your website, I can write your email campaigns, I can plan out your social media mm -hmm. strategy, but I can't do any of that until we establish your brand messaging first. And right. the way that most brands, like we talked about at the beginning, the same way that most brands are real are really, really clear on, well, you know, you would never see Coca-Cola on a blue background. We know that. Right. Like right. you you just wouldn't, right? You would never see yeah. you would never see the New England Patriots wear green and yellow. You just sure. You Right, because they have very clearly established their brand style, and we all know mm -hmm. what that is. So, if we saw Coca Cola on a blue background, we'd be like, "What is going on? Coca Coke's on red." Yeah. Well, we know that. Yeah. But what most people, what most businesses don't do, is they don't clarify the messaging and the the voice that they speak with. Mm -hmm. um, and one one really sort of good kind of tactical way to do that, and this is a little bit of an aside, and we can come back. Um, but a way that I've I've sort of designed to help businesses do this 
is to take the voice, particularly if you have a lot of different people writing copy, if you have, you know, a content creation, or if you, you know, if you outsource it or hire a third party, then taking a voice that people already recognize and applying that voice to your brand. So I'll give you an example. Yeah. When I started in karate school, one of the main things, one of the main reasons that people sign their kids up for karate is not because we have world champion coaches, it's because of the difference we can make in their kids' lives. And that has very, very little to do with kicks and punches. So when people come in right. and they, they want to sign their kids up for karate, they're not signing them up so that they can learn to fight better. They're, right. they're signing them up so they can become more disciplined, more focused, more respectful, more confident, get better grades, all of those things. Well, yeah. so that means that a fundamental part of what we has to do with these core values, these, you know, these sort of integrity, these, you know, these uh, high, high character qualities. Well, yeah. we're also talking to kids. So what we started thinking about is who is a character that people understand that represents those highest character qualities? So we settled on Captain America, right? Mm -hmm. Captain America sort of represents all the values that we want to impart onto these kids. The problem though was the Captain America's, you know, a, a man. He's a grown man. So we're not going to take the Captain America voice and speak to children that way. So what we did is we said, what if all of our copy, all of our emails, all of our everything sounded like it was written by Captain America when he was 15 years old? Mm. Now I can give that to a copywriter. I can give that to, uh, you know, it, really anybody. I can give that to my staff. I can give it to my team. And mm -hmm. I can say, this doesn't sound like it came from Captain America's mouth when he was 15 years old. And if it doesn't stick within these, this framework of the customer is the hero, they have these problems, we are the guide, we demonstrate empathy and authority, we give them a plan, we call them to action. If it doesn't check those boxes, something's wrong with the company. Mm -hmm. We go back until it checks all those boxes because it needs to fit that brand voice and it needs to fit that message framework. Okay. So that's the first thing that I do with, with companies that I work with is I say, sure, I can write you an email, but how do you want it to sound? Are you more formal? Are you more casual? Are you, you know, are you a premium brand? Are you a discount brand? Are you, you know, wh where do you, where does your voice fall? Where, you know, who mm -hmm. are you and who do you yeah. sound like? You know, yeah. maybe you're really accessible. Maybe you're LA DeGeneres. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're, you know, Kim Kardashian. And, and the difference, you know, between, I always tell people, Think about if Clint Eastwood opened a bakery, what would how would Clint how would Clint Eastwood talk about his cupcakes? You know, like right. that's brand voice, and and I think that establishing that I know that establishing that for any company is really really critical because what it does is it filters out all the people that you wouldn't want to work with in the first place, and that's why that's why niching down into your into who you want to serve is so critical because otherwise you're just going to be the kind of the kind of business owner who has clients that you resent people you don't want to work with because you haven't really sort of planted your flag and said this is who i am this is who i'm for and by extension this is who i'm not for right so this will be fun for me hopefully fun for some of the people watching uh do a quick audit of my brand voice okay Let's yeah. do it. Let's go. So let's go top to bottom. Okay. Okay. So let's say I'm going to get pen and paper out if you don't mind. Sure. Of course not. Who's the character? Who's the hero in your story? The hero in my story is the person who has found strength where others have broken. Okay. You know what I mean? The person like like Amanda, the person who, and, and very much, of course, like myself, who's been through absolute hell. Okay. And there's a small percentage of people who, when they go through the, one of those like really like profound gauntlets of struggle, not the short term struggle that most of us consider struggle. <clears throat> and then they they come out the other end. A small minority goes the direction of if it's within my power, I'll, I'll, I'll see to it that no one else has to suffer. You know what I mean? Like I'll do everything I can to help other people not go through it. The majority go sort of into reaction. And, and so so. My my people are the people who have been through the ringer and because of that experience didn't lose their empathy and now want to help other people. Okay. So I want to say <laughs> Jackie says Manny reminds us of Clint Eastwood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. Nice. Okay. So I want to say that back to you. So people who have gone through a, a true ordeal profound levels of struggle. Yeah. 
and who have come out on the other side of it, not only stronger because of it, but empowered to help make sure that other people can survive the same struggles. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Like our mission stems from the desire to see that others don't have to go through what we did. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's say that that's their goal. So I want to make sure that, you know, I want to make sure that nobody goes, let's go drug addiction. Let's say I want to make sure. That was me. Perfect. perfect. Okay. So let's say that I want to make sure that no one has to struggle with addiction the way that I have to struggle with it. Mm-hmm. What is my challenge? What's your challenge in in getting there. So why why can't you just go and talk to everybody and make sure that you know that nobody has to struggle with addiction again? Because there's some struggle that you're going to have to go through in order to in order to be able to get your message out. Do you mean in terms of like just how to reach them or in terms of or is it an in, well, internal I want to make sure I want to right now I want to make sure that mm-hmm. no one has to struggle with addiction the way that I had to struggle with addiction. Yeah. But I don't know how to make sure that that happens. I don't know how to reach those people. I don't know how to get those people. I don't know how to, you know, I, I don't know where they are. I don't know what my messaging looks like. I don't know why they should trust me. You know, what's my, what's, why can't you do it yet? Why don't you have a, a you know, million dollar business helping people overcome addiction yet? So I think the answer there would be uh, like, there's two distinct realms for that answer. And and one of them, of course, is, is the uh, reach the reach audience and, and, you know, um, uh, you almost might call it lead gen. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's that, that whole kind of really, really for, for so many of us, the tough, tough puzzle of like, I'm here, I've got the message, I've got the goods. I can put the stepping stones in the river. I'm ready to do this. You open the doors and it's crickets. And it's crickets. Perfect. Right. Okay. So, so let's go down. That's there. yeah. Yeah. That, that would be the, that would probably be the thing is like, how do I attract them now? I'm teaching to an empty room. I'm teaching. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching to an empty room. Exactly. Perfect. So then I think, and I, I kind of want to do this next part together. The next phase yeah. is the internal problem. So it's, yeah. you know, it's how does that, as the person who opens the door with this beautiful mm-hmm. plan, and everything is ready. And I know I can make a difference and I will change your life if you'll just give me the opportunity. And then I fully right. order up and ready for the crowds to come in so that I can start making my impact and my dent in the universe. And nobody comes walking in the door. So how do I feel at that point? I'm feeling a little hopeless. I'm feeling a little, you know, I'm feeling Yeah. Well. Yeah. The feeling, the feeling is one of, there's a sense that there's a challenge here, but not even being able to sort of wrap your head around what the challenge is. Right. So right. It's sort of like a, like a, uh, you know, you have a blind spot, but you can't find it because it's a blind spot kind of mm-hmm. a thing. I get it. Standing at the top of the mountain, or standing at the bottom of the mountain rather yeah. and not even knowing where the top of the mountain actually is. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I would have said not even realizing you're looking at a mountain, <laughs> but, e- but either one works, right? Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Okay, cool. All right. And I think that when we get on that philosophical plane, we can mm-hmm. start saying things like people need you. You know, this is, you are doing a service as much as you're right. building a business. You deserve, you deserve the platform to be able to go out into the world and change lives. You shouldn't be limited by, you know, by not knowing how to do the tactical work of reaching a large audience. That should be, that should be easy. Let's get into the real work of making a difference in people's lives. Yeah. Let's let's get this little, you know, that should feel like just a all right, kick that little hurdle out of the way and start sprinting towards making a difference and actually making an impact. You know, if anything's gonna hold you back. I think that that's kind of the the way that we do we position that messaging is from a philosophical level is your your ability to impact the world shouldn't be limited by your knowledge of reaching large audiences. Sure. Sure. All right. So then now we step in as the guide. So if it's you, how are you demonstrating empathy? I, I heard you say that drug addiction was something that like, I've been there. I know what this feels like. I know what it feels like yeah. to be at rock bottom and to have to claw my way out and come back on the other side. Right. Okay. Um, the actual mechanism for demonstrating empathy is, and I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but the actual mechanism is through content. Sure. But uh, right, that, that's how I do it. Like, this is where your story comes in as the guide. You know, most of this story is about yeah. the customer, right? Most of this story is about what they're going through, their struggle, their desires, their hopes, their dreams, their identity transformation. This is where you get yeah. to say, here's why I am the guide you are looking for. 
Here's why I am the person who's going to be able to take you across this, you know, across this chasm. Got it. I got right? it. Right. And that's because I've been there. I've been, yeah. I've been gripped by addiction. You know, I know what that feels like. I know how it feels to be lost. Yeah. Yeah. It's something, I, you know, from that standpoint, it's something I struggle with every day. It's something, you know, that you learn how to navigate those waters. Um, and then authority. I've come out on the other side and built successful businesses. I've helped other people do the same thing. Mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of people. I'm, you know, I put out one post on Facebook and my calendar gets booked two months out now. You know, right. that's something that my life would have looked like, you know, however many years ago. That this yeah. is this is a place that I have figured out how to work myself back to. And not only have I worked out how to build myself back to, I took notes along the way. And if yeah. you just follow that same path I took with my help and I'm going to hold your hand every step of the way, we can help you speak your message to the people who need to hear your message as well. Right. Right. So what we're doing, this entire conversation has yeah. been writing, right? Like what we're doing is right. Yeah. 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 Totally get that. Every single thing that we have said, you know, this is the bucket that we're putting all of your content into, you know, so right. whatever company we're working with, you know, as we're having these conversations, we're just going back and we're saying, all right, well, you know, I know where you're going. I know what you're feeling. I know what you're experiencing. I know what you deserve. I know mm -hmm. I've been there before. I know how this feels. I can take you through it. You know what I mean? Like that's all, that's all effective copyright. Right. Exactly. And what it is too, is as we're doing this is we're, we're copywriting, but we're not allowing any fluff to get in. We're not allowing any of the, like mm -hmm. uh, the, the noise, which frankly is how most people write copy. It's, you know, I'm going to write a long form sales page, which means I need to stick a lot of words on this page. And most people don't think about what those words are actually saying. So by, by having this copy, you know, we're making sure that it is really stuff that is going to cut to the core of these people's individual experience. Yeah. So what's the point? What's the first thing that I do if I want to work with you to get my message out about overcoming addiction what's the first thing that i need to do in order to in order to hire you in order to, like what what do i do? the first thing you need to do in order to hire me is to click the link and book a call perfect yeah all right now people love threes and this is really sure. specific and right. sure but people love threes step one step two step three yeah if you say i have a six step process people are kind of like uh oh, it seems like a lot you know yeah. if it's Two-step process seems incomplete. Yeah, so totally, totally. Three and four are kind of these magic numbers as far as yeah, as far as the plan. So when we create a plan, it's we're going to do this first, then we're going to do this, and then mm -hmm. this is the experience that you'll or this is the outcome you'll experience on the other side. So yeah. the framework I like to use for a plan is step one is always going to be what do I do first? What's the first stone I step on in my way across the river? Yeah. The second thing is sort of a generic overview of the process. So for you, it could be, and I, I don't know anything about your services, but it could be step one, book a call. Step two, we'll work together to create the platform you need to reach the audience you serve, yeah. something like that. And then step three, a picture of what success looks like. Yeah. Step three is, you know, you'll be able to make the impact that people need in the world. Right. Step one, book a call. Step two, we'll work together. Step three. Now, am I leaving pieces and parts out of that? Of course. Right. Yeah. But if I said, well, step one is you're going to book a call. And then step two is I'm going to call you and we're going to settle, set like an onboarding time. And then step right. three, we're going to spend, it's like, stop. Like that's too much. You know, yeah. if it's, if it feels like, all right, well, I'm just going to click this button and I'm going to book a call and then we're going to work together. And then I'm going to be, I'm going to be at my, you know, at my, my fullest impact. People go like, that makes sense. I can work with that. Yep. Did you ever see the, um, you ever see the South Park episode where it's like, step, I forget exactly what it is, but it's like step one, collect underwear, step two, question mark, step three, profit. <laughs> no, that's good though. <laughs> yeah, like, like, we don't really know what's going to happen in the middle, but like, right. you know, yeah. it's a picture of success. Right? Yeah, I so love it. Exactly the context, but, but that <laughs> work is like step two is this sort of big picture look at we'll work together. I'll guide you. I'll help you. I'm yeah. You. Yeah. Um, and they already believe that because of every, all the groundwork we've laid before it's mm -hmm. you, you explain their problem in a way that's getting their head nodding. You've presented yourself as the guide with empathy and authority. And so now, as long as you say, I have a plan, mm -hmm. they go, okay, yeah, you're the guide. I trust you. I'm following you. I'm going where you tell me to go. The thing yeah. about stories is that within a story, 
a hero is not a particularly strong character until the end of the story. You know, you look at, you look at Harry Potter, you look at Star Wars, and Luke at the beginning of Star Wars is kind of a punk. You know, yeah, he's, he's yeah, on his yeah. Phone. You know, it's not until he goes through this transformation and does the work with the guy that he comes out as a Jedi on the other side, right? He's not somebody. Right. Who, he's not somebody that you admire until the end of the story. The story is right. about him becoming that person. Yeah. The guide is already there. The guide has already experienced it. So mm -hmm. in most stories, the guide is typically the strongest character. So you're yeah. basically as the guide, you're saying, "Come with me. I know the way, and I know what it feels like to not know the way." Yeah. So that next part, after we've created a plan, book a call, we work together, you make the impact that you deserve to make. Now it's, so now I need you to click this button and book a call. Right. It's a very, very clear, direct call to action. Now, if they're not ready to take that action, then you give them other options. You know, If you're not ready to book a call yet, if you're still just kind of testing the waters, if you're not sure that this is the right move for you, you know, then you've got lead generators and video series and content and watch my videos and all these things. So you've got what are called transitional calls to action. But all of those are, are geared towards getting them where you ultimately want them to go, which is on the phone with you so that they can retain your services, right? Everything always points back to what do you want me to do to begin this journey? And it's book a call. Right? Sure. That's the crux of everything. Yeah. And then at the end, we paint a picture. We set the stakes, right? The example I always use is if Liam Neeson's daughter got kidnapped, and if he didn't get there in time, they were going to blow up a balloon and put it right next to her ear and pop it, and it would be really loud. Right. So that was the <laughs> stakes. If you don't come rescue your daughter. I'm going to pop a balloon right next to her head. He's not going to, he's going to fly, he's going to fly commercial to get there. You right. know, he's not, <laughs> not going to have a very specific set of skills and kill you. Like it's the stakes have to be high enough for the customer to, or the, the audience to want to buy in. Right. I've got to, I've got to know what it looks like, no matter like whether I succeed in getting what I want or whether I fail. So for the last parts of our copywriting, we got to paint a picture of, what does success look like? What does my life look on, like on the other side of this? And what does my life look like if I elect not to move now and I elect to let this problem get worse? Because it's not going to take care of itself on its own, right? So what does success look like and what does failure look like? Is this story a comedy or is this story a tragedy, right? We have to very, very clearly outline the stakes of what happens if you do, what happens if you don't. Yeah, and yeah. When we have those, those buckets filled. At that point, we can say, all right, now we've got the content, we've got your brand voice. So looking at you, how would you position your, yourself? I guess that's that's a great way to start this is if you were to establish your own brand voice, if you were to give yourself a character, what characters and values, I guess is a values question, what values do you feel like your brand sort of espouses more than any others? Well, um, my brand is, straight talking, honest, no bullshit, compassionate. Um, Heard resilience too. Resilient and um, wise. All right. So here's what we've got. We've got a resilient, honest, direct, wise, and compassionate guide. Yeah. Now, what you can do is you can scour your knowledge of pop culture or of, you know, or whatever, of literature, of, you know, mm -hmm. whoever that is. And you find a character who speaks in a voice that you want to speak with, who you admire the way that they talk. They, as a character, resonate with you because they are honest, they are resilient, they are direct, they are wise, they are compassionate. Does anybody like that stand out to you? you well, can, I mean, I think that's. What'd you say? Even if they, even if their voice isn't exactly the, because we can tweak it. Remember, I was Captain yeah. America, but he was fifteen, right? Yeah, yeah. We were close with Captain America, but we had to make an adjustment. Yeah. Um. It, it seems like there are actually like a lot to choose from, you know, that, for that. Those that that's that's kind of the the archetypal set of qualities that the guide has. Okay. Um, so it, it could actually probably be Captain America. Okay, perfect. I really? Like yeah. So what adjustments, if you're, if you're Captain America, if you're resilient and honest and direct and wise and compassionate and Captain America checks all those boxes, check plus, right? Now, yeah. how do you 
you need to adjust Captain America in order for him to become Manny Wolf. What is oh, Captain I have a bigger vocabulary. Okay. So <laughs> you said a well-read Captain America who's in recovery. Yeah, right. That 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 could work. Yeah. Strictly yeah. speaking, I don't consider myself in recovery anymore, but that's that's maybe a, an irrelevant detail. Um yeah, no, that that could work. Um maybe sometimes a little more gruff. Okay. Yeah. Amanda's saying Clint Eastwood. So. <laughs> and, and Clint Eastwood is a great one. Like, you know, I, yeah, I, totally. I think, I think again, he checks all those boxes. I don't get him until some of his like later roles. I don't get him as quite as compassionate. Right. Yeah. So maybe like Clint Eastwood, but if he went to therapy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but. So, so what we're doing here is we're picking something, even if we have to take it and tweak it, just to sort of personify the idea, right? Three levels. And you actually have done a tremendous favor for me because what I did is as we were doing that, I realized that we are in a three-step process, right? Mm -hmm. Step one, and this is hopefully a huge takeaway for your audience right now. Yeah. Step one is values, right? And I love, yeah. I love alliteration, so I, mm -hmm. I figured it out. Step one is values. What are the values that your brand exemplifies? What are the yeah. values that your brand represents, right? So for you, it was the resilience, the honesty, the directness and the boldness and the, and the wisdom and the compassion, Yeah. right? Next, whose voice? So first we have values. Second, we have voice. Whose voice is that, yeah. right? There's going to be a character that, you know, that resonates with you in some, you know, in literature, pop culture, it doesn't matter who it is because it's more a filter for yourself. Right. It's an internal piece. Yeah. It's an internal piece. Mm -hmm. So even if you explain it to your best friend and they don't get it, it doesn't matter. Right. right? Yeah. For you. All right. So first values. Second, whose voice is that? And then third, what variation do we need to make? Yeah, that's nice. I think, I think this is where the rubber meets the road right here. Uh, with your with your three V alliteration, we we've now brought it into the concrete really tactical. Yeah, exactly. We've got we brought it into the concrete tactical. So um, I want to be mindful of your time. Um, we've got about five minutes left. Keep going. Do you have another call? No. Oh, okay. I guess I was under the impression you had another call. Um, uh, so now for our brand voice. We first have to identify our values. What what do we stand for? And guys, this is so there's something interesting here that actually sort of bleeds over into yesterday's call. I was talking about polarizing and polarization yesterday and how so, there there's a there's a fair amount of people who resist polarizing at all because they don't want to be seen as a clown. They don't want to be seen as just overly controversial. And that's sort of our example of what polarizing, like you, you'd use Donald Trump, right? Like him or not, if you don't get that he's polarizing, you're just kind of foolish, right? That's his whole jam. So, but that's also what like, there are people who, who, who look at that and go, I don't want to have to do that in order to be considered polarizing. If you, it is good to stand against things. Sure. It really does help. But you can do it like um, by just standing strongly for things. Um, there's a uh, there's a coach named Jesse Elder who does this really well. He doesn't come out and stand against things in his public facing content. He stands very strongly for things, and those things he stands for are, are very esoteric and very sort of like like not everyone's going to get the message. And then as you get into his coaching and his training and his products, he's he sort of reveals these different levels of where he's not afraid at all to just say, no, 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 that's bullshit. This is wrong, you know. And so he gets polarizing in a more direct way inside his content. Um, I, I only use that example because you just sort of sparked that in me. But so when you, when you pick your brand values, uh, there's going to be built in polarity created when you say this is what i stand for i think so there's one caveat to that and what's and that this, so this is something that i feel like a lot of um a lot of businesses and i i have this conversation with them a lot when i when we talk about brand values is there has to be a viable alternative to your brand values in order for them to truly be brand values so if you said hard working what's the yeah. alternative 
lazy, right? Like right. Yeah. You know, hardworking is not a particularly a, a particular telling brand value because there's no real viable alternative to it. Right. You know, unless you said something like efficient, you know, I'm going to work as smart and as little as I can, then I guess like, you know, you're kind of establishing, you know, it's, it's off the top of my head. But the point is that you need to be, you're either formal or you're casual, right? Yeah. Either one is totally okay, but right. you can't be both. Yeah. Right? Like you're either Kia or you're Bentley. Yeah. You don't, you don't get to be both. Right. Yeah. Don't ever try to be Honda. Right. <laughs> that's, that's not a smart goal. <laughs> All right, cool. So we've got, we've got get your values. And then we've got uh, the second V was. Whose voice is that? Whose voice is it? So personify it. Personify it. And you don't, and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to sound exactly like Obi-Wan Kenobi or, or Princess Leia. You can, you can use them as sort of your, um, your archetype and then add and subtract as you need to. Yeah. And then third is. So two is voice. Two is who's your sort of your, your character. And then three, because you don't have to be exactly Obi-Wan. Three is variation. How do you need to. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Change that person in order for them to hit your brand voice. So then we use that as a, we kind of hold all of our, our public facing communications up to that, right? We hold it up against that mirror of like, does it match my values? The voice that I've decided on with the variations I've included. Could I imagine the character that I've described? Could I imagine them writing this copy? Could I imagine them speaking that way in this video? Could right. I imagine, like, that is the character that we are going to embody, when we, you know, when we present ourselves. And and for most brands, particularly most brands, you know, that are that are coaches or that are, you know, sort of single people working, you know, we're not dealing with, this would be very difficult to do for Pepsi. This would be very difficult. Right. No, this is more like for personal brands. That's exactly right. Yeah. And in general, these values are going to be an amplification of your own personal values. You know, they are an right. amplification, you know, if, if, even if you have a team, you're probably working with people who have the same core values. You know, one of the, one of my core beliefs is that you should be absolutely stubborn in your values and your vision, but absolutely flexible in your strategy. The North Star doesn't change, but the right. road you take to get there might change all. And will, yeah. I, I would say it will change. Yeah, that's good. Um, I wanna stop here because I think that that's, that's a solid, solid little, it's not little, I, I shouldn't even say little, That that's a solid takeaway for people. Cool. Um, that's really gonna help, I just wanna, kind of, you know, sift through the ashes to see if there's anything else we want to get. I don't know, Kyle, I feel pretty good about that, man. Great. Yeah. I feel like you, you, you really gave them something. We got some high level ideas and then you did a nice job of bringing it down to a tactical, a, a tactical level. So awesome. well, cool. I really appreciate being able to be here. This was fun and um, love to do it again. All right, my friend. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, I will be back tomorrow and then off Sunday. And then Monday, we start full speed ahead. Kyle, thank you, sir. Bye, guys.